recording uh, an hour ago. So, okay, well, uh, I'll give a few minutes for people just to sort of pop in here. And then we'll begin in earnest. So, we have about 22 people right now. This is a tea time and using a technology that we have available to us as much as possible. I'd like to recreate something that happens in our monasteries on a regular basis. Um, and it's not completely a Western invention. Um, one of the main ways that the people connect with the monks in the forest tradition is to draw near and to visit the monastery and to do what's called sontanatam, uh, which is talk on Dhamma. And it's one of my favorite ways to share time, share my knowledge, my experience with people. Um, I like the back and forth. Uh, I can speak to people's uh, immediate concerns and situation a little bit better than just giving me a general talk. Uh, it tends to be more personal and direct and um, enjoyable. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine was in uh, Chiang Mai, the north of Thailand, and they told me they, they went to a, a monk chat. And I had never thought of this as monk chat, but uh, once we go online, it, it does feel a little bit more like monk chat. Um, so, but for now, we're calling it tea time, and I'm drinking coffee, of course, for those who know me. So I hope you brought a cup of your favorite hot beverage along. And we'll just give a couple more minutes for people to get in here. Uh, and I'll say a few introductory comments. I haven't had a chance to check on our poll, which is on the uh, community section of the YouTube page. Some people are having a hard time finding that. So you can just email me through the monastery website, or if you have direct connection or access to me, you can reach out to me that way. But um, looking for feedback as to what would be most useful times, and we're honing in on a Saturday, 4 p.m. at this point. And we'll also be looking to do something on a weekday. Currently, I'm thinking maybe uh, a morning time on a weekday so that we can cover people that like their dom in the morning. And, uh, oh, wow, we have a special guest. Ajahn Sona is here. <laughs> and he's given the, the, given the sound a thumbs up. So thank you, Ajahn. It's very nice of you to pop in. Uh, so... Seeing Ajahn Sona reminds me of something that's been happening a lot to me these days. Uh, I gave a short reflection uh, for the YouTube channel this week, and I'm endeavoring to do one per week. Uh, the one I put up there this week was just a very uh, brief look at uh, the five reflections. There's several things upon the dawning of this uh, pandemic uh, period that we're entering into that came to mind as uh, relevant teachings. One of them was that, the five reflections. And lo and behold, today on YouTube, a beautiful tea time from Birkin Monastery uh, featuring Ajahn Sona and questions from the community there starts off with what other than the five reflections. So when you when you finish this live stream today, if you have time, please visit Ajahn Sona's channel, uh, the Ajahn Sona channel on YouTube. Uh, there are lots of Ajahn Sona videos, so you want to find the Ajahn Sona channel on YouTube. And uh, he, he does a very eloquent job as ever. And he leads right from that into one of the other reflections that I've been thinking about a lot. So I hope I don't embarrass myself on this, <laughs> on 
on this podcast, but go and visit Achan's. And I imagine some of you have seen the reflection. Um, and if you have, then maybe you could give me a little bit of feedback, uh, just so I know who's seen it and who hasn't. Um, I, it was very cursory, and as I mentioned in the test live stream this morning to people, my thought was to make it short and also introduce uh, the theme uh, for those who might not be familiar with it uh, as a form of meditation. Um, many people have heard of mindfulness. Many people these days have uh, done various forms of meditation, uh, and especially in Theravada slash Vipassana realms, uh, reflections aren't oftentimes taught so strongly as a, a form of meditation, but it's something that dates right back to the time of the Buddha, and it's something that I use in my everyday practice, um, uh, especially in my morning meditations. Uh, more often than not, I'm spending a good period in my early morning meditations, uh, dwelling on these reflections. Uh, and the five subjects for free collection is one of the earliest that I often do in the morning. And these days uh, I'm doing it every morning as a way to start off my day. Um, there is the concept of a preliminary meditation. So rather than just uh, jumping into your main theme of meditation, the idea of taking a bit of time to cultivate a little bit of loving kindness or to bring up one of these reflections sometimes uh, can be a wonderful way to sort of set the tone, even if your main form of meditation is uh, breath meditation or uh, some other style of samatha or some other style of uh, focusing the mind in a more non-discursive way. Uh, and I find that this recollection around the five subjects has been sort of something that I met early on and found a, a great value in. And uh, it's something that uh, almost from the very beginning days of my monastic training at Wat Nana Chat, uh, I encountered in the daily meditations. So... For those of you who, who may not have, have come across this before, uh, the five recollections are, uh, I am of the nature to age, I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken, I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die, I have not gone beyond dying and death. Uh, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And then a reflection on kama, being the uh, owner of one's kama, the heir to one's kama, born of one's kama, related to one's kama, and that we abide supported by it. And the way uh, the teaching on kama is pretty profound, but it's affirming the intentions that we bring to uh, thought, speech, and action. And uh, one way you can think of it is uh, those make a difference and those create the kinds of world that we uh, live in and the, and the world that we inhabit. So uh, I like mostly to sort of focus on the early ones, though, uh, especially uh, in this sort of time period. And uh, because I want this to be interactive, I'm not going to give a, a Dhamma talk uh, right now and and go on about this. Uh, some of you are very familiar with this. And uh, if people have uh, particular questions uh, around the practice of it, then please at any time just pop into the, uh, the chat and uh, raise your question. And I can uh, integrate that into this. And I think it'd be more interesting for people. This is what the technology supports. Um, we can have a little dialogue sort of back and forth 
uh, I'm pretty good at endlessly rambling on. So uh, please interrupt me. Uh, this is one of the trainings you get as a senior monk. You become skilled in uh, holding the floor. So... So absent questions, I will I will just keep uh, pontificating around these these themes. Uh, when I when I first encountered these as a young monk, uh, I took these up and started to practice these. Uh, and it's maybe uncommon for a, a a young man in his early twenties to be spending a, a bit of time every day thinking about aging, uh, illness, death, and trying to make that real. Uh, and one of the things that I uh, would do in the reflections was not just kind of reflect on the very nature of that and how I am subject to that and the naturalness of it, the inevitability of it, but also uh, contemplating sort of... Um, people in my life, bringing up memories, bringing up images, especially of the people that I'm close. And in the meditation, sort of reflecting on, where am I with this? Just to raise the thought of the inevitability of aging. It's like this giant stone rolling forward uh, that cannot be stopped. Uh, whatever you do in your life, uh, it is inevitable that uh, this process of aging just rolls forward. Um, and what does it mean to age? Uh, it's it's bound up with uh, that which robs us of what we identify as health, so sickness. Um, as we as this aging process rolls forward, we encounter more sickness, and we're liable to more sickness. And um, no matter how developed uh, our technology and our medicine is, or how well we take care of ourselves, um, from the moment we're born, uh, we have this as our nature, uh, and we are subject to it. And there is an inherent insecurity in the human form in these dimensions. Uh, you cannot escape it. You cannot escape aging. You cannot escape sickness. You cannot escape death. You will be separated from the things you love, the things that uh, are comfortable and pleasing to you um, at some point in some way. I guess the best case scenario is you wouldn't be separated from much until you finally die. But at some point you will. Um, and there's several dimensions to uh, how we use this practice to address what we might call the psychological and spiritual problem that's bound up with being a human being and having those natures. So, so we've got a few questions now, and maybe we'll put the first one up here for everyone to see. Oh, it's blue. It wasn't supposed to be blue. So give me... Give me just a second, see if I can. Change this on the fly. I see what I did. I was trying to be clever earlier and this is what I get for it. Okay, so let's go back to that. So, Wise Ass has a question. My work requires lots of abstract thinking and synthesis, software development, engineering, and I have decent mindfulness outside of this after six years of practice. And I still have trouble maintaining the outside, it outside mundane repetitive tasks. Any advice? Thank you, Bonte. So uh, the way I read this is you're, you're talking more about the maintenance of 
mindfulness and the challenge of having a job where you have to do a lot of abstract thinking. Uh, mindfulness is quite broad. I would uh, revisit the the teaching on the four foundations of mindfulness. Um, it's quite likely from the nature of your question that you've received a fairly narrow definition of what mindfulness is. Um, if you look at the canonical teaching on mindfulness, um, there are many ways that one maintains mindfulness in short, and uh, it's not really the target of our theme today, so I won't go too much into it, but uh, the bulk of them are focusing on the body, and these death contemplations do figure into that as well. So uh, just keeping in mind uh, part of what being mindful is, is to remember. And it's to remember to keep the mind uh, grounded and focused uh, on the things that help uh, undermine the uh, afflictions of the five hindrances and allow one to uh, cultivate uh, the kind of strengths that help support the cultivation of the Eightfold Path. So, um, and one has to uh, experiment with, with some of these. Um, you know, you, you may be identifying mindfulness as something that is uh, more refined and discreet. And if you look at the sutta, just being aware of the posture could be enough to keep you grounded in the present moment. Um, you know, so if you're a programmer, um, use your creativity and try to come up with ways to bring yourself back into the body. Um, I find using a standing desk sometimes helps because uh, you're just a, there's a little bit more motion movement that kind of induces a presence in the body. Um, you can use timers or bells to remind yourself to just return to the basic kind of sense of having a body the posture you're in, how it feels. And just directing the mind to that pulls it away from some of the proliferative energies of the mind and some of what is feeding the hindrances. So in short, I would say uh, revisit that sutta. And if you have the opportunity, attend our upcoming retreat with Birkin Monastery. Ajahn Sona is going to be teaching on this very theme, uh, and his teachings on mindfulness, I find, are, are quite exceptional. Uh, he does a wonderful job of showing the interconnected nature of this as a path factor and how it relates to all the other path factors, uh, right view, right intention, um, and critically, right effort and right samadhi, or right concentration. So uh, that's, let's maybe kind of move on here. Sama Sankapa, questions on the five reflections. So yes, questions on the five reflections. That, that's what I'm encouraging. Um, we could stray slightly outside of that if people have other questions. This is, this is our inaugural run here of the uh, Saturday live stream tea time. Uh, let's see. Can you go through, let's see, Zen Rider. Remind me where you're from, Zen Rider. You, you're from Oklahoma, right? Uh, can you go through how you do this meditation practice? Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, my comments are not screwed. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, there are, are many ways to do this practice of the five reflections. The simplest of them, and the one I referenced briefly in the reflection that I put up uh, on the YouTube channel this week, is to look to our chanting book, um, which is linked on the reflection and uh, take, it's a very short reflection, 
you could write it on a three by five card. A little stick it pad like this or something would be good. And um, now the camera doesn't want to focus. This is the bane of webcams. <laughs> okay, let's take a minute to see if we can get the camera to focus. Okay, back in focus. Uh, so I was suggesting look at our chanting book. It's linked in the reflection on the YouTube channel. And just get yourself a, a card or something. Write them down in brief. And uh, make a determination to uh, just spend at least a little bit of time on a daily basis going through that. Um, it can be very useful just to memorize this so you don't have to open your eyes and, and look at this written down. But maybe for the first bit, just write it down and put it in front of you. Um, and then what I do is I, I spend just a little bit of time focusing the mind uh, to calm down just a little bit. And then internally I chant um, the first of those lines to myself. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. And I just, I say that kind of watching over the mind to uh, arouse a sense of sincerity and even a sensitivity to the truth that is embedded in that statement. Um, if the mind seems uh, dead to that, it doesn't mean anything to, to one. Um, you will want to spend some time sensitizing yourself to the reality of that. Uh, and But at, maybe the first thing to do is just, is just to learn to memorize these and then bring these up into the mind and this is an act of concentration and mindfulness in and of itself. Um, you memorize it and then you remember it. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. And as you say it, you watch over the mind, watch what that sort of brings up in one. Um, and it's a way to sort of check in, at least in that moment, where you are with the truth of that. Um, and the Buddha is very clear about this. The point is not to arouse fear or anxiety. Um, it is to arouse other kind of more wholesome states of mind. So it can arouse a sense of urgency. It can realign the choices that we're making in life and the priorities that we have. Uh, it can be very soothing and cooling because so much of the focus of our life is trying to ignore that and run, run away from it in a sense. And just sometimes just the, the naked truth is so comforting to hear. It's like so much of our, um, our discourse, our language, our culture, and our focus uh, is directed otherwise. And so sometimes just to, just to return to sort of the present reality and more fundamental realities, um, just as we do with body awareness. Uh, it's just, just to return to the simple feeling of, I have this body and it's in this posture and it feels like this. Um, one, it's very centering. Two, it's very grounding. Um, but also it's, it's, it's sobering, it's cooling, it's peaceful to return to the truth and to dwell in the present moment with truth. So you go through these, I'm of the nature to age, I have not gone beyond aging. I'm of the nature to sicken, I have not gone beyond sickness. I'm of the nature to die, I have not gone beyond dying. I am of the nature to be separated 
from the people and the things that I love. And I'm, uh, my world is built of the karma that I have uh, engaged in and that I'm doing. I usually try to go through these in a fairly short period of time, one by one, sensitive to uh, what that's arousing. And this is a, a tip or uh, uh, some guidance that I read in the Wasudi Maga when I was a, a young monk for developing a meditation like this reflection. And I might notice that one of these feels a little more um, sticky or inviting or interesting or pregnant. Um, it's inviting further investigation. So as I'm going through, my mind might f be sensitive to my death or it might be sensitive to the aging process. And uh, I could just stop there and go into that and then spend a, a period of time really developing uh, an enhanced sense of mindfulness in the present moment, resolving any hindrances, even developing um, a certain level of samadhi based on that, a kind of stillness, a wholeness of mind uh, based on that which has a clarifying effect and opens up the possibility for a more grounded investigation into that truth that could arise in further insight into how it connects to the other dhammas or even just how it, um, how it can generate psychological or spiritual insight in one's self. Like you might sort of see like, oh, this is where it's sensitive, or this is where I'm hung up. Uh, when I was a very young monk in Thailand, and I would go through this, uh, oftentimes contemplating death, I would spend some time bringing images up of the people that were closest to me, my teachers, my friends, my family, and, um, and one of the closest people in my life, of course, was my father, who was very dear to me, and we had a very close relationship. And I ordained and trained in Thailand. So the early years in Thailand, I had very little contact with him. This was before cell phones were common at all. And we didn't have a phone accessible to the monks in the monastery. I wasn't much of a letter writer. And uh, I would often bring him to mind. And uh, to arouse the, the reality that these things will happen and can happen at any time, often would reflect, I'm here in Thailand, he's in America, we don't have much communication right now. He could be dead right now. Like this is the reality of the, situa of the present moment. He could be dead and I, I wouldn't know. Maybe I'll find out in a day, maybe I'd find out in a week. This is the truth. Um, and interesting enough, I was uh, talking with my sister recently, um, around the time that this pandemic really started to become real for all of us in America, it was clear that it was going to become uh, a big challenge. And uh, I think it was around the time when the state government in Washington here was uh, asking people to stay at home, somewhere on there. And um, we were talking about family members. And we talked a little bit about, you know, sort of just the, mm, how it's good to prepare oneself. I mean, it's true that people can die at any time, but especially when you have something like this going on, uh, it is useful to sort of prepare the heart you know, think about um, think about various people that you might uh, find out today, tomorrow, next week, in a couple months, that um, they're on death's door or that they have died. And um, how are you going to feel about that? And I must stress, this is not to uh, 
support unwholesome states of mind. This is not to make you depressed. If you find you're moving that way, you need to pull back and go spend some time uh, doing what makes the mind uh, wholesome, balanced, and happy and energetic. But, you know, if the mind is in a very in a wholesome and balanced state, these are very useful places. These are very useful reflections to sort of bring in and give oneself a chance to rehearse, to visualize, to prepare for these eventualities. Um, you know, my, my mother, my mother will die. I mean, I have a mother and stepmother who are alive. All my fathers and grandfathers are dead. All my grandparents are dead. So the eldest people in my family are my mother and my stepmother, and they are in that age range where if they get the coronavirus, uh, it will be uh, a life-threatening challenge for them. And and so it, it, it's good to prepare oneself for it because we don't give much time to that. We spend so much of our life just hoping, wishing, and wanting, or just otherwise distracted. So it's very useful to to kind of prepare oneself for that in a wholesome way when the mind is in a fit and strong place. And in particular, to, to square oneself off with it, to uh, arouse a kind of full acceptance that this is part of nature. This is Dhamma. This is what it means to be a human. These things are inevitable. And it's not worth generating suffering around these things. Yes, you might feel sorrow. Yes, you might feel pain. Yes, you might feel the dukkha of the separation of love. But if one really uh, practice, practices correctly, they develop the strength to and the conditions to lessen uh, the amount of suffering one is going to be liable to. So uh, let me go back here and scroll through the questions. I feel... If, uh, so let's see, we have a few people here. Haley, good to see you. Liam, uh, I was told you live with Lumpur Gunna for a year. Do you have any good stories? Yes, I do, Liam, but we're not going to go there today. <laughs> But we will get there. So, and let's see. Haley, uh, this has been there for a while. So, do I typically go into deep discursive thinking with each of the five reflections, or is it more bringing on each kind of thing? Um, it's both, really. And, um, you know, these reflections, there is there's a kind of creativity and latitude that you want to bring to them. Sometimes I will bring these up with the thought of using them just to create serenity in the mind. Uh, as a meditator, you know, um, it can be hard to sort of tame the proliferative nature of the mind. And sometimes these have a very beautiful, sobering kind of quality to them, which just takes it out. I mean, you sit down and you're meditating and there's all the... Um, some and jetsam of your day, the office politics, the things that you're caught up in, and we are attached. And one way to break that attachment is to reflect on <laughs> one of these sort of wisdom frameworks uh, to get us back to something that is uh, more real, more uh, central to the human experience. And it has ability to sort of rob the power that's sort of feeding the proliferations. So, um, and it's very good when you, you know, I have to stress this early on. Um, if you're going to pick this up as a practice, I would give yourself a, a commitment to take it up for 30 days. And maybe at first you just do five minutes in the morning, five in the evening, make a commitment to learn it well. Um, if you can memorize it, that's the best. If not, write it down on a piece of paper. It's big enough that you can easily prompt yourself and go through it. But if you memorize it, you can go through it in the mind very nicely. Um, and uh, I've been surprised 
with some of the people in the white salmon community who I've reflect, uh, I've taught this practice to. Um, you know, one person was in a stage in their life where it was not practical for them. They they just had young kids. Um, it wasn't practical for them to go on retreats, and it was difficult to meditate in the house with very young kids. And there's some other stuff going on in her life, and I suggested that she take up these five reflections. And um, you know, later after having practiced them for some time, um, she reported to me that she found it really uh, beneficial. And uh, I've known many people over the years who have picked these up and um, just practiced with them for a period of time. And eventually they, they do help develop some inner solace and help us kind of square off with these truths of the five reflections. So, so I apologize if I'm going to miss your questions. There's just too many and I am not yet skilled at this, but uh, let's see, can someone else's comma become our own? So hi, Barry, welcome to the live stream. Um, I'm not going to go too much into comma today. That's a very big subject, but the short answer is no. So let's see. Zen writer, is there a way the five reflection can help with financial worry? Absolutely. Um, and as many of us probably know right now, this this could be as bad as the virus. The uh, disruption to the current uh global economy um, probably will kill people either through shortages of material or food or psychological. You know, people will be um, ruined financially and I'm sure some of them, it'd be too much for them. It will crush them. It will and die. So uh, these can help with financial worry. Um, in particular, you know, if you just think that no matter how much money you have or how little you have, you're, we're all subject to these things. Uh, the thought that you can't take it with you, um, you know, you're going to die and you can't take it with you. So, but the one that is probably best is, and that targets it very directly, is that uh, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become other eyes, will become separated from me. And uh, this problem of ownership is a, a thorny one. Um, we do have agency, but uh, ultimately we're not in control. And um, it seems like we're in control because we have a sense of agency and we can make things happen. But if you pay close attention, we're not in full control. And this touches on some of the insights the Buddha is pointing to in his teachings on anatta. Um, if it was really yours, then it would be yours. You And what it means to be yours is to be fully in control of it. And um, your money is not yours. It's only conventionally yours, and you will be separated from it. And there are forces and conditions outside of the things you can control that might bring that about. Um, and so just like developing these reflections around aging, sickness, and death, one needs to uh, reflect that that's the truth. That's the stone-cold truth. That is a, a central truth. Um, and one needs to uh, not be distracted or deluded from that as a reality. And the more we reflect on it, then the more that can inform us on how to uh, adjust and, and live in a way uh, where our happiness and well-being aren't uh, bound up with or even demanding uh, that we have financial security. Financial security is great. You should do everything you do to, to develop it and to hold on to it and to keep it, but not at the expense of 
psychological and spiritual well-being. So, uh, let's see. Ruby has a series of questions here. She's Oh, Ruby's nicely typed them all out here in the chat for people. So let's see if I can go through them really quick. And the chat is recorded so people can come back and get these, but also you can see the link in the reflection I put up earlier this week on the reflections video and just go download the PDF. I am of the nature to sicken. I am of the nature to die. All right, so those are there. Yeah, good to see you too, Haley. I hope you're well. Question from Vince here. Hello, are the five reflections, <laughs> five reflections, uh, related to the four Brahma Vihara? Um, I've never thought of that. Uh, I do have a theory that all Dhammas are uh, related in an intricate way, um, but I think I'd have to think about. <laughs> uh, nothing strikes me off the cuff um you know the they're they're related in the sense that both of them are recognized as skillful practices that help support our endeavor to uh cultivate the path so i mean at the very least they have that and sometimes when people are exposed to the variety of reflections and meditations that exist in the in the canon in the poly canon um they can be a little bit confused about how these kind of integrate uh and the short answer is if practiced correctly they all lead in the same direction uh they have a different flavor if you will it's maybe we can liken it to food you know i mean uh, almost all food is composed of the three macronutrients of uh, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, but all foods are not the same, right? Uh, and we need we need these uh, to sustain life, um, and so we eat. Um, these various uh, reflections and cultivations um, feed our dhamma practice when uh, done in uh, a correct way. So maybe one one other point, point to make. Uh, when one reflects deeply on the truths of these five reflections and the uh, inevitability of them, uh, they do they do sensitize one to um, the fact that all human beings are carrying this burden around. Um, and various psychologists have kind of gone into this, like this is part of what ails man, <laughs> to use an old phrase. Uh, somewhere in our consciousness and in our mind, um, we, we know that we are liable to these things and they are having an effect on the way we live. And um, the, the afflictive uh, mental states, uh, our habits of fear, our habits of anxiety, our habits of uh, depression, uh, our kind of even sort of clingy greediness. Uh, it's, I think it's 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 all 
feeding sort of um, those particular sort of habits. And when one re reflects upon uh, these truths uh, in a way that uh, aligns with the path, um, I find it does open up the ability to practice the Brahma Viharas. Um, one of the most profound experiences I had contemplating uh, loving kindness one time was just reflecting on the burden of dukkha that a human carries. And uh, you know, if you take to heart the Buddha's injunction that we, we don't know dukkha, not in a deep, penetrative way. Um, we are deluded. Our eyes are half shut in a sense. We're otherwise focused. When you see um, the full cost or the, the, the full dukkha that a human being carries, uh, it makes total sense to relate to people in a way that is free of ill will and a way that is compassionate and a way that appreciates the blessings and the joy that they have in their life that is for others uh, instead of being jealous uh, of others. Um, and, and the final Brahma Vihara of equanimity, um, you know, in a more common word, we talk about acceptance and the perfection of equanimity is the perfection of acceptance. Uh, and I oftentimes think of it as wise love. Uh, it through a deep uh, understanding of Dhamma and the cultivation of wisdom, one comes to an acceptance of the way things as they are. Um, and you know, when I think about this time we're in, uh, there's this balance that goes on uh, in my daily kind of conscious experience. Uh, oftentimes I'm thinking about the, the level of suffering that this time uh, invites into people's life because of the uh, insecurity and uncertainty that it brings. That's inherently dukkha. That's inherently unsatisfactory. That's inherently hard to bear. Um, uh, not to speak of the financial problems people are going to have, the uh, the sickness that they'll have to endure, and, and the physical, emotional pain that might come along with that. The death of loved ones, even the death of people outside of our family, you know, like when famous people die that we, we care about or that figure in our psychological geography, you know, um, some political figure, some artistic hero of ours. Um, you know, if you receive the news tomorrow that they have died, all of a sudden you, you find yourself living in a different psychological geography geography or a different geography it, it changes what it means to be you it changes what it means to be alive and a human being in a way that is um is painful it's dukkha um but if one cultivates these five reflections frequently and the buddha says frequently <laughs> these are five frequent recollections one has a chance to uh, familiarize the heart with the inevitability about this, the naturalness of this. Um, and one of the reflections that comes up to me sort of as I contemplate dukkha and that balances it with equanimity is, is a reflection that nothing special is going on. And I think, it, I think this is something I, I don't want to say casually. Here I'm saying it on YouTube for the whole world. <laughs> but hopefully not everybody will find this. Um, but if one has really contemplated uh, Nama, Dhamma and the truth of 
uh, of Dhamma, the truth of the of a human life. Uh, there's a way that it does make sense that there is nothing special going on. Um, viruses are just part of this whole uh, ecosystem that we live in. And when new ones come along, things have to shift, change, adapt, and adjust. And yes, there's dukkha, but um, it's not something that we necessarily necessarily need to pick up and the skillful response is not to create undue uh, stress or uh, afflictive emotions sorrow etc um, and this brahma bihar of equanimity and acceptance it's not saying it's good uh, it's not saying it's bad it's saying this is the way it is and if we understand the way it is, we can be at peace with it. Uh, it doesn't have to spoil our sense of uh, well-being. And it doesn't have to be uh, an extra burden to doing the things and helping in the ways that we would like to in life. Um, <laughs> So, so we are nearing uh, the end here today, and uh, for those of you who have stuck around, uh, let's see, we have nine thumbs up and 32 people. So um, for those of you who have come around to uh, join us today, this will be um, the first of what I hope are many uh, Saturday uh, tea time chats here on uh, YouTube, and I'm still learning the technology. I, it's a real trick to try to speak to this theme and follow the follow the chat. So if I didn't get to your question today, um, I apologize. But please come back. Um, there's been a lot of interest in doing one of these on the weekdays, so I'm looking at probably a weekday morning, and we'll be announcing that fairly soon. But we will be back. We, the royal we. I will be back. <laughs> I will be back next Saturday at four o'clock. And there should be a new reflection coming out um, in the coming days. And while these uh, tea times, I, I really endeavor for them to be quite interactive. And we'll get some audio worked in here as well so that people don't just have to chat. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe to start these off, I would prefer people sort of um, subscribe and, and keep aware of the reflections coming up. And that can be a little bit of something that we focus in on uh, for a topic so that we're not just all over the place. But uh, I really do like seeing your icons and um, connecting with all of you. So please come on back and um, there'll be other opportunities as we go forward to, uh, to connect until we meet again in person either here at the Hermitage or at your Dhamma Center. So um, thank you all for, for joining us. And this will be up on YouTube for people to uh, revisit. And um, let's see, I'm supposed to do something here. So... Okay, thank you all. And we'll see you next... Saturday.